All set? Okay, so uh, I'm Matt Carroll, and I run Pizza Pass Press, and I'm gonna introduce today Emily Boardman in Dulaway. Did I get it right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Emily conducts research with partners at Media Cloud and promotes engagement with their tools. She draws on a background in health communication and nonprofit consulting and management. Yes, thank you, Matt. Okay. <laughs> um, I will just add a bit to that and then give my talk. So um, I recently joined Northeastern in November along with Prof uh, Professor Bargo, Rahul Bargo. He and I have worked together for several years when we were at the MIT Media Lab, which Matt was also at. I've sort of been trailing Matt along yeah. unknowingly for <laughs> a few years. Um, and I have been with what we call the Media Cloud Project for about five years now. And just I'll, I'll show you the tools at the end and, and go into a little more depth about how they work, but it's a high level. Um, it is an open source, so everyone can see the code, everyone can build on it, everyone can use it. Database of media globally, we have over 50, actually it's 60,000 sources uh, globally, and over 1.5 billion stories in there to date. Um, and so part of what we do is just maintain this and create user-facing tools and make it something that's for the community. And that community consists of journalists, foundations, advocates, um, people who would like to use it for their own business or commercial needs are welcome. We don't necessarily put effort into supporting that because <laughs> uh, it's not aligned with our mission, but they're allowed to do that as well. Um, so it's really for anyone who would benefit from a news corpus. And then we have partnerships with foundations and with advocates to do research on the news corpus and to answer questions. So I wanted to start with just talking a little about media research because it was something I didn't really know existed as sort of a media adjacent career and endeavor. Um, if one isn't actually a journalist but is really interested in news and wants to derive useful, actionable learnings from the news. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about that and then give some examples of my work and then we'll actually go into the tools today together. So talking about what are some of the key applications and purposes of media research as a field. What are some of the things that we actually can take news data and answer questions about? A big one is just discourse analysis for the purpose of social change. Looking at any issue you're interested in and understanding what is being said about this issue. Um, what are the differences amongst different geographic media markets and how this issue is discussed? What are the differences in partisanship of media? We also have some social media data. What is the difference between how people talk on social and how news talks? Um, all sorts of opportunities there to look at missing narratives. Um, one example is in the discussion about data breaches and, and social platforms. There's a missing voice we discovered of advocates, privacy advocates, community advocates for individuals who might be affected by privacy issues. So you can see whose voices aren't part of this and how can we help um, inject needed voices into the conversation. A second purpose is media accountability. Um, not just on are you telling the truth or not, that's not really the role that we have, but more along some commonly accepted practices, say around covering suicide, covering shootings, ways that how the media covers an issue becomes a public health issue in those two examples. Um, we are able to evaluate how well our media is sticking to those guidelines and then make recommendations around that. Um, one piece we just did on Neiman Lab, you may have seen me, Rahul, and Meg Heckman actually, uh, around coverage of uh, Kamala, Harris, Kamala Harris's fashions <laughs> and other women candidate fashions and how in some ways it's okay if you're talking about it as they're using an empowered decision, particularly the white suffragette outfits, but we don't want to be emphasizing that um, in gendered and sexist coverage. So that's, that's some examples of media accountability. Next one is, this is becoming ever more popular, <laughs> tracking the origin and spread and misdisinformation. and disinformation. Obviously, mis and disinformation is as old as you know verbal communication and humans, it's always been around. Uh, social media does make it worse, does allow for it to be worse. And we, one thing that we try to do is understand how news plays in with that. Are people co-opting factual news and misconstruing it on social media? Or is there particular news sources that are really contributing to the um, origination and spread of mis and disinformation? One thing we've recently looked at is preprint archives. You might be familiar, these are places where scientists can post early results of research online. Um, they're actually quite useful in the biomedical world for people to quickly see results and build off of each other, but actual scientists, when using them, understand the limitations, but because they're open online, lots of people can see them and then go misconstrue the results. There's certainly a lot of that happening with COVID coverage. 
Um, and so we're able to see where are links to these preprints showing up on the web in news and in social and how are they being talked about. Um, another way is identifying influencers. This news data is an interesting sort of hard number as to who's being talked about the most in a conversation. So it's no longer just about um, followers or things that, while still numerical, might have more or less value to a specific community and look more at a larger scale in mainstream news collections who are really being um, cited the most in certain conversations. And that's both so that advocates can target people that they may want to partner with, but as well try to say, hey, here's a missing voice, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then finally, understanding the impact of campaigns. Sometimes we partner with foundations or nonprofits to look at a specific um, event or campaign and we see how did, how if at all did that impact future news coverage about the issue and was there greater understanding of the angle that you were trying to get across. I'd like to make this interactive. So does anyone have any questions about what I've just shared before I move on? Yeah. So do, do you like work for the campaigns or do you work with the campaigns? And how do you choose what campaigns to work with? Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't, um, we come in afterwards oh, and we help do evaluative work. Um, some of what we do in the first one, understanding the discourse, helps plan, helps people to plan. Um, but we've never actually been like a communication partner because we always try to live in this interesting hybrid space of we are a research group, we are academic, we don't want to bias results, we want to be discovering truth and <laughs> science, but we also have a pro-social mission. So we're only partnering with organizations with pro-social missions. Yeah, I have a question about threat and origin and spread of uh, misinformation and yeah. disinformation. Uh, you mentioned the pre-press or the pre -print. Pre -print. Yeah, yeah, pre print servers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are you tracking it from uh, individu individual users or are you compiling a net of sorts of different groups uh, who actually publish them? Yeah, so on that we do both. But for the preprint one and specifically, we were looking at domains, news domains, where the URLs to the preprint were showing up. Um, so more looking at what publications are citing preprints and how. Um, but in an example I'll go into detail with later, we were looking at misinformation, disinformation around Greta Thunberg, and there we were actually looking for who, what individuals and groups posted things about her and who kind of started narratives. Also another, more forensic. Yeah. Another question uh -huh. uh, about the gods of actually publishing a preprint uh, in a news outlet. Is it actually legal? publish a uh, long peer review the yes the yeah as long as you state that it is a preprint I mean even that is probably not illegal but <laughs> pr good practice would be to say a preprint published here says this and to explain the context and, and certainly many reputable sources do that um, with interviews from the scientists themselves and from scientists who question the results sort of contextualizing it mm. yeah all right um, so now I want to talk about those are the types of things we can do and questions we can answer and what, how do you get from a news article to that? What are some of the dimensions of analysis that we use? Um, and all of this, what the, the power here in the research that we do is the aggregate, is the amount, the volume. We can roll up and look at things at a large scale and that's a much different and in some ways for certain questions more powerful than taking 10 articles and doing a deep read. Of, I mean, that has its value for sure. But what we're answering is more system and ecosystem level questions at these with these metrics. So the first one is attention. Um, simply looking at not just the count, not just volume, not just the New York Times had 100 articles and Washington Post had 50 on this particular issue, but actually a normalized percent. That's something that's really powerful about our tool. It's we're ingesting close to everything that these publications produce and so then we can get a percent. Then we actually know of all the things that they write, 5% is about women's equality. In this paper and this paper, it's 10, even though the number might be lower. And so that's a powerful metric. Um, also, not just the volume, but the when um, peaks in coverage happen. We plot the hits to a certain topic over time and we're able to see a large increase around a certain date or event or maybe one that you would expect to see that isn't there something that you thought was newsworthy that isn't causing a spike in attention um, the next one is language so there's so much 
really quickly, even the five years I've been involved in this developing field in natural language processing and the ways that you can use machine learning to analyze language. Um, there's some things that are more simple, like just counting the frequency of words, uh, taking all the words of an article or a set of articles, eliminating what we call stop words, words like a, the, he, she, ones that aren't meaningful to you, and then simply counting the frequency and then you're able to do things like comparisons. Um, an example I'll go into later, we did a comparison of a black media collection against the top red US mainstream media collection and we're able to see really different narratives on the same issue based on the top words. Words like history, family showing up in black media with a unique frequency as compared to mainstream media. Um, other types of language you can do, which is connected to the next one, is topic modeling. Um, there's different levels of sort of human involved or machine driven topic modeling you can do to um, analyze the text and then derive what are the main topics and themes that are used. One thing that we do a lot in Media Cloud is we have a New York Times trained classifier that uses all of the New York Times stories from I think it's 20 years and some, not us, <laughs> some blessed people went and hand-coded, this is about weather, this is about politics, and then fed that data into a classifier. And so we run our, uh, any story that we get in English against that to do a automated um, theme tag so we can then compare. New York Times publishes more topics on this theme than Washington Post. Do you have to keep tweaking the topic classifier? So we don't personally, but it's a it's a widely used um, widget. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's babysat by. Okay. But but it is it's actually a good point that you bring up because Rahul actually was the one that just noticed recently that because we're we're trying to do some better auditing of our machine learning tools for in baked in bias, and he noticed an example of that in that classifier, oh, nice. okay. um, where if you just write the sentence, the Arab man boarded the plane, it tags it as terrorism. So that's horrible. So we're actually doing internal audits about like what can we use instead of this or how can this be improved? Yeah. Yeah. Um, entities. Oh yeah, go ahead. What if I have like new themes? Like before COVID, COVID wasn't like a theme. Like how do you do Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah. So that would come under health and wellness. So that it will always be caught by something more general. Oh, okay. Um, but there are some specific tags, like there's a tag for the 1998 or whatever the year was, 2000 presidential election, and there's not one for the 2021, for example, but election will still tag. Okay. So that's actually a great, what I've just shared about the bias and what you're saying is a really good point to make, which is these machine things can point us at things. And then we, it's always critical that the researcher eye come in and read and reevaluate and take that as a arrow towards a direction to dig and see if there's something else there and see if it holds up. Yeah. Yeah, do you actually use uh, themes for that as well? Uh, so basically on the website, for example, you have a story uh, which was classified by AI and uh, then at the end of the story, you have uh, several boxes about themes and you make actually people choose what themes uh, the story can be classified under. Mm -hmm. Do we actually do that or? Do so we don't personally involve um, human coders in yeah. our, in our outward facing tools, but in our internal projects, we do do that. Yeah. Um, the next one is entity. So again, this is one where there's a lot of great machine options for extracting names of people, organizations, geographies, and then you can do things at scale, um, looking at who's mentioned in coverage and what locations are mentioned in coverage. Um, another example from the Black Media Project with entities was in when you look for when you use a query that chooses the names of the countries of Africa and major African diaspora countries when you then see what countries are most often mentioned in coverage so not just at all but the most frequently mentioned in coverage when you look at that subset of data in mainstream US news it's still China and the UK <laughs> that are mentioned more often so stories that talk about Africa they more often talk in that article about China, like China's influence in Africa. Whereas in black media, it is more focused on Haiti, on Nigeria, on those countries. So that's the sort of thing you can get at scale from entity extraction. Um, hyperlinks, so this is one that um, Danica and I are working on a research project about. We can extract out hyperlinks from stories, which is such a critical, essential part of digital news. 
um, to understand lots of things. Um, what news articles are linking to can indicate who, what's an authoritative source, what's an original source of information, um, what data is considered valuable. But it also allows you to build networks. So then you can see which sources are linking to each other and you can understand things about the media ecosystem more at large. So I wasn't personally involved in this, but a component of our project lives at the Harvard Berkman Klein Center for Internet Society. And they did a large scale project that turned into a book, Network Propaganda, looking at how the right, sort of far right and center right media play this really tight network where they almost don't link out, they very rarely link out to other sources, whereas left and center media have a much broader network. And it's, they've sort of insulated themselves even through hyperlinks. And it's just, it shows you the cleaving of, of the information ecosystem through hyperlinks. And then last is social shares. This is a metric that we use. Um, it, we use it in combination with other things and often it's to understand the most influential story or publication within a topic. Um, I did a project a few years ago about um, HPV vaccine coverage because we were looking at, we knew there was a lot of misinformation there and we wanted to understand more about that. And among the top 10 most shared articles about that issue were three from Natural News, which if you're not familiar, it's like a total junk, <laughs> I don't even wanna call it science, junk science, junk site. It basically exists to sell supplements and they make um, fake news stories about, about scientific topics, but it's quite popular and it, it was definitely leading amongst shares for that topic, which is too bad. What do we call it? Nature News? Natural News. Natural. <laughs> Good, good name. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so now I'm going to talk about I think Actually, can you, uh, the yes. social media thing. Are you so are you searching social media sites as well? So we have a few different ingests inside of our tools. We take every time we bring in a story, we go hit the Facebook API and get a share count for the story. Okay. So that's how we're able within our own tools to rank by sharing. But we also have um, Buzzsumo we use for. Uh, share count information and we have a CrowdTangle account as well but anyone can use a CrowdTangle web browser extension to visit a URL and see the share information for the page. Yeah. Do you actually track uh, screenshots and uh, shared screenshots from news? Screenshots for what, sorry? Uh, let's say there's an article and there's a link and someone just screenshot of the article uh, well the link to the article uh, with a bit of a preview and then they just shared that instead of a link. Oh, no, and, and we're not taking sort of snapshots of pages. Something like the Internet Archive does that, um, but not our tools. Yeah. I'm wondering what you, do you, if you do anything, because it's really hard to like track news discourse that's in like more, you know, locked off mediums. Like, you know, like, oh, sure, people might be not getting their news from a website or like social media, but they might be like seen on a Discord server, like mm -hmm. on a far right like social media service, like, like Telegram, are you doing yeah. things to like track that? So we want to do that. Right now we're not. The closest we get is Reddit. Uh, we do have Reddit ingest, and we, we work closely with Jason Baumgartner, who founded PushShift, if, if you're familiar with that. It's like a repository, open source repository of Reddit for researchers, um, quite similar to our tool. And so we do a lot with understanding how news and Reddit is playing and what's going on there, but we haven't gotten into those locked places. But someone that we um, collaborate with occasionally, Kieran Garamella, I think he's at Rutgers now, he created an interesting methodology to get into WhatsApp groups where his group actually bought you know, 25 cell phones and just made them join all of the open groups they could find in India and WhatsApp. Oh, and they actually were able to prove with some of what they were finding coordinated behavior by the BJP to send out messages and kind of create almost fake trends on Twitter because they would say, everyone tweet this right now. And it would look like it was coming from your buddy, but it's coming from really them. <laughs> so that's an interesting methodology. Uh, but ourselves, no, we're not really in those close spaces yet. So I'm gonna cover just a few examples of my work and then we'll, uh, perfect, I wanted about half the time to dig into the tools, so that'll work out well. Uh, so this one was, you might recall, the shooting in Christchurch, New Zealand uh, in 2019. And this one was not a funded project, it was just something we did uh, for our own interest and our own wanting to contribute here. 
and we cover we took all the articles we could find from these five countries australia canada new zealand uk and us for the two weeks following the shooting and we wanted this was one in the media accountability purpose we wanted to understand based on pretty well um, understood and accepted um, guidelines about covering mass shootings, how well were the papers, or at the country level rather, not the publication level, adhering to that. So these were some of the um, met the actual things we looked for. Name of the shooter, you're not supposed to do that. Um, some papers and some people feel that they still want to and they have arguments for that and I can understand. So, I, so, yeah, just so I understand it, yeah. so, so it's um, the green, so UK is 30% of of the stories about the shooting included the name, name of the, shooter. the shooter okay yeah and this is at the country level not the publication so part of what was happening is that certain publications were throwing it all to the wind and doing everything wrong uh, but even some of the more mainstream ones were also doing this 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 wouldn't be like someone posting on facebook though kind of thing no this is all just um stories. mainstream media okay. not even super fringe in these countries okay. yeah great question um so yes, name of the shooter was the biggest sort of violation area. And unfortunately, it's also one of the key principles because what you want to do is not give a motivation for notoriety, which has been shown by different social and psychological studies to be part of the issue here. Um, the next thing was the name of the forum. The shooter posted, I can't remember now, but I think it was Reddit, um, some, some social posts sort of previewing this event and talking about his beliefs. He had this manifesto, the great something, great resistance, I can't remember, but it had a title, it was easy to search for. So absolutely, papers should not be linking to that, should probably not even be mentioning it. You could say there was some social posting about this or something, but you don't need to direct people to that ideology, and that's what we were um, trying to evaluate. So fortunately, that was less, um, but you could still see a, a little bit of um, trend here with Canada being about second highest on some of these. Uh, same with the name of the manifesto. Keywords for ideas motivation. Um, we worked with an expert, Joan Donovan, on extremism and looked for some specific words that were in and of themselves harmful words that you would not want to see in the coverage and, and they were showing up there. Words that he was using in his, in his ideology and his manifesto. Um, specific means, again, she helped us generate that. That was a lot less. She was saying, um, we don't want this to be described as someone who was a troll or trolling, because this is this is a mass murder. This is not, you, you can't put this in the same category as an online troll. Unfortunately, that was still, I don't see this as much today, but a few years ago, that was still a way that was being talked about. mass kills trolls? They were saying he was an online troll because of his hate, hateful posts oh, oh, okay. on social media. Okay who then became a, a shooter. And then finally, um, Alt-Right just recently had an AP guideline as to how to talk about that. Um, and it's not supposed to, and, and unfortunately I should have reminded myself what the do's and don'ts are there, but there is now a proper way to do that, to talk about the Alt-Right. Um, so this was just something we ended up writing up in CJR, the Columbia Journalism Review, and just sort of pointing back out there, here's how the country's did, here's things to look at. Yes. What are the memes? Like, did the New York Times like make a meme about it? Like, what does that mean? So he had it's some curious. memes that he was referencing. Oh, he kind okay. of created this weird breadcrumb internet thing, okay. which unfortunately people love that. Yeah. <laughs> people love to solve a puzzle and go online, yeah. and so we didn't want. And and the guidelines say you don't want to invite people into that. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. So it was a. I don't really want to say it, particularly on the recording, yeah, okay. but it was a racial meme that he um, included. Okay, so this next one is uh, the tracking mis and disinformation purpose, and this was about Greta Thunberg. And this one we were engaged by the German Marshall Fund to work on. Um, they really wanted to understand more about mis and disinformation, and they care a lot about the issue of climate, and they, want, they thought this would be a great way to combine how can we understand some of that better. And so we really did kind of a forensic uh, study here where we first started out with some of, we use Snopes actually as a, as a starting point of what are some of the most popular debunked claims about her. Um, and that helped us have some initial keywords, which we then plugged into our system, found any, 
any articles that mention or social media posts that mention that. This is one where we used Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit as well. And then once you find a few things, often in this world, everything gets tied together. You see, you find something about vaccines and it talks about 5G and Dark Soros and it's all sort of a web. So if you can find a couple of things, you'll find more things to search for. Yes. A uh, quick question about uh -huh. this story. What exactly was the dis uh, disinformation about uh, Greta Thunberg? What was the disinformation? Yes, what was that? Yeah, so that's what we, that's what I'm kind of trying to go into here is we ended up with these six narratives that we found. And then we were trying to find out where did they start, how did they spread. So the one up here is the Antifa narrative, that she's an operative of Antifa or maybe even the leader of it. Um, another one was that she is a puppet for various people, but we ended up with the word puppet itself, but also it was primarily for George Soros or like the global cabal or whatever. Um, another one was that she was uh, had mental disabilities and was sort of that was being masked. Um, a lot of like derogatory terms there that I'm not going to say, but that we were looking for there. Um, another one was that she was part of a oh gosh, what was the term? Capitalist climate com complex, industrial climate complex. Essentially, that climate change isn't real but that people who want to solve that really just trying to make money and, and sell things and have a new industry that they control and that she's a piece of that. Um, those were the main ones. There was one or two others, but so then we go in and we, we on all these platforms try to find out using keyword search, where is the first post we can find that mentions this or relates to this? And can we track, did that post then get shared? Did it go into a group? Like how did this uh, kind of get bigger and bigger? So and then the Antifa one started on Twitter, and this was one where, again, this was at a global scale. When we were finding this was really in Germany that this was all starting, this Antifa narrative, which was interesting to me. Um, I, I thought this was kind of a US thing, um, but it was really the AFD, which I'm not going to attempt to say, but it's a, it's a right wing party in Germany, kind of French party, um, was promoting this and saying that. Um, and then she, there was a picture of her that was taken for an album CD when she was kind of early in her public years and she was wearing a t-shirt that said all-star Antifa. It looked like the all-star shoe logo in Antifa and that of course got released and then she said you know I didn't know what it was it's not related to this but that sort of created all of this in March. Oh good. And then it didn't sort of make mainstream until July. So even this, that's first story, that's news, shows you how often this stuff is starting in this world and then moving into the news world, um, which is better, right? We don't want the news to be originating. Um, so that's an example of that sort of project. I, actually, yeah. So the, when we talk about the first story, is it yeah. the first story saying, hey, this is a bunch of crap or that So we were just trying to find anything talking about it okay. at all. Okay. That one was, this is crap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this one. So uh, we have this project we did in 2020 with the Gates Foundation. One of their big, big issue areas is promoting gender equality. And they're particularly interested in how using news as a bellwether of how a society feels about something. And well, I think that's a, a strong one of several ways you can, you can get at how does the social society has a society value certain things by how often things are mentioned in the news and how often um, certain narratives are present. So they created, it was actually really an interesting framework that they came up with these three commitments that they wanted to see news doing. They wanted to see more quotes attributed to women. So more of the people who are interviewing articles are women. They wanted to see women as the protagonist in a story more often. That's one where we had some back and forth and we thought, how can we do this at scale? Because they wanted it for six countries. So we're not gonna be able to read that many articles. So we ended up coming up with the headline name. If a woman is mentioned in the headline, that's a, we all agree that's an indicator that they're the focus of the story. Um, and then the fourth one, uh, percent of the news stories that are about women's equality issues. So this is where we had to do a lot of iterating to come up with a keyword query that got us at stories about women's equality. And then we evaluated them at the country level. Um, there was so much work that went into this, but I thought this was like a good roll up chart. And then you can see here the performance of the countries on these three 
uh, indicators against each other. And you can see some countries that unfortunately like Nigeria was the lowest one in the aggregate. Uh, but I actually had an opportunity, this was a cool way of turning research into action to speak at a conference because of COVID, it was uh, virtual, of journalists and advocates in Nigeria and share this fact and say, here's what we found. And let's talk, like, why do you think this is? And what are some reasons for this? And they had some really interesting uh, perspectives, particularly about women's sport and how that was an area that needs to be developed in the country um, and how women politics women politicians were not given the same representation in the news and it was cool to get to that problem solving stage because you don't always get there with research mm. the uk i will say um, definitely is a leader in this and in, inequality in the news they have the bbc um, there's a name for it that's escaping me now but the bbc has an internal system to check how many sources are in your story and how many of them are women and that's something that they've implemented at a publication level, and that's really made a difference for them. And so, but by the way, this would be, for instance, the UK, all the publications that you track in the yes, UK? Yes, that's okay. right. right. Mm -hmm. But I think the BBC kind of created a, a news, news area wide trend in that at the UK. I think this is the last one, yeah. So the last one I'm gonna talk about is that I've referenced a couple of times is our Black Media Analysis. So we partnered with the City University of New York and the Craig Newmark Journalism School, and they have a really interesting emphasis on community media, and they've done some work to create directories of community media, so they have a Span Spanish language one, they've just did their black media one, and now they're doing an um, Asian diaspora media one. And so what we did was we took those publications, fed them into our system, and then I worked with an expert in black press, Kim Gallen from University of Indiana, to come up with what are the topics we wanna look at, what are the queries we would use, and we ended up looking at race, health, uh, religion and identity, and politics, and comparing the way that coverage is different between the two collections, um, among many things, attention, language, entities, all of those I mentioned earlier. I thought this chart was particularly powerful. So looking at the highest, single highest date of coverage, so in the year that we studied, um, which was March, beginning of COVID, March 2020, to June 2021, I think was the research period. Yes, because it was, well, was that when the Chauvin trial was? That was the end date. I think that was it, yeah. Um, for the query about race and racism, what was the highest day of coverage and how much coverage did that topic get? So George Floyd, on the day with the most attention to George Floyd, got over 60% of coverage in the black media sources. And this is 100 sources in an aggregate, not just a few. And only 37 in mainstream media. So that's a huge difference. Same thing with flu shooting or death. This one I think is really interesting, just being explicit about white supremacy and privilege on the day that that got the most attention, 15% of articles versus four in mainstream media. So this is a really powerful way to quantify the different lenses that are used. and. Similar interesting results we had in the health realm around the issue of um, vaccine access, um, around attention to diseases that more prevalently affect black Americans. So this was a cool study. Okay, so let's look what you're understanding. So 61% of stories in, in any, On that day, on, on the day that got the highest, which I think for George Floyd was a week after his murder. Okay, so they might have 100 stories, so 60, one of those stories on average would be okay yes okay so the last category here i hate this is so confusing okay so black media white i don't know what what i don't even understand this so white supremacy privilege i get yes. that but how would a black there's a black media organization that covers white media so this is articles that talk about white supremacy oh, articles or privilege. That talk about, okay sorry 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 i thought it was yeah. a bucket of white supremacy news of news sites okay. no yes okay. articles that mention that or okay. give give coverage yeah, yeah, okay. to that right. issue all right my bad yeah does that make sense now yeah, yeah, yeah. Does, totally. yeah. did you have a question oh yeah. um sort of i just forgot that i was recording for a second so i want to ask you to repeat sure. uh, quote, uh, a powerful way to quantify oh i was saying different lenses that different are used lenses, mm -hmm. and different um priority that's given to different issues all right, so hopefully that get, that kind of fleshes out what this is all about and, and the interesting things that we can do with it. Um, just a bit more about MediaCloud and then we'll go into the tooling. Um, as I mentioned, I think, we, it was developed initially at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard in 2011, actually 2009. 
and then incubated at the MIT Media Lab. Um, the PI for my, the principal investigator for my part of the project is Ethan Zuckerman. Um, he's now at the U UMass Amherst, and he's really focused on digital public infrastructure, is how he calls it. Creating an open web that is both not closed, i.e. there aren't data vortexes <laughs> um, where no one can see what's in Facebook and what's in the closed places, as well as um, providing ways for people to be advocates for positive and healthy online spaces. Um, but he was our PI at, at Media Lab, and then Rahul and I came over here after off record the implosion at the Media Lab. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's over one billion stories in the article. I mean, in the in the corpus, as I mentioned, um, which also means, and you will see this today there are a lot of places that things can break. So right now we're in a break zone. So the tool is working up, if you search up until September, 2021. If you search after that, it's not gonna work for you, but we're trying to fix it at the moment. Um, and then all of it is open source. So you can see our code, you can see everything that we do in there. Um, and some people just use it simply as a media library. Let me get a list of the publications in Ukraine. Like it'll just tell you, it's, it's, that's useful in that as well. Did Danica break it, by the way? Was she the one? Who <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> or not fun. <laughs> no, she did not. All right, so let's go ahead and go in the tools. Get a window up and then I'll share again. Drink the water. So we have three tools in our system. Um, Explorer is the one we're going to today. I'll talk about it in a minute. Topic Mapper is one that, in addition to t showing you what's in the news corpus, it also pulls from the wider open web and it also incorporates the social shares and the hyperlink networks. Because it brings in those additional pieces, it doesn't give you instant results. You tell it what you want and it can take two days to a week to go fetch it for you. So that's why I don't do it in live demo. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, source manager, is our library. So it tells you the sources that we have, and this is how you can get those lists of media. So let's do that quickly, because it's always a good idea to know what you're looking at. Does anyone have something they want to look at? We can look at partisanship collections. We could look at that black media directory. We could look at a country. Go ahead, yeah. Jordy. You have some of them. Go ahead. Can we see how like right-wing media is functioning in like other countries besides the US? Sure, I will show you a private collection. That's the public. So, so this is an interesting thing around contagion idea. We track that stuff. We don't want to make it easy for someone else who might want to be in that space to be like, oh, what's the list of websites I can go visit? So we have private collections of some of that. Um, so I can show that to you. It will show on mine because I'm an admin, but if you were to go to this, it wouldn't. Um, let me find, I know there's one for Poland. So we've partnered with a couple of uh, groups who work on extremism. It's an important thing for us to study um, ISD and then this Weizenbaum Institute. So that's why this says RNIS here. So here's one for Poland. So this is a bit small, which I guess if it's for bad, that's a good thing. Um, there's 15 sources. So you can see a URL, which if you click on this, it'll take you to more information about the source, when we ingested it. This when is an important question for research. Um, I had someone I wanted to work on understanding pre and post Modi years in India, but we didn't have a lot of the sources in India until after Modi took power. So we realized we couldn't actually effectively answer that research question. Um, stories per day, which if it's zero doesn't mean that it's dead, it might mean it's a weekly, um, or in some cases we do hold on to sources that have died because we want that historical data. Um, let's go ahead and just click one source just so you see like the information that we have when we look at a source level, and then we'll go into Explorer. So these are all questions because these things are detected on English. So this is not an English source, so we're not gonna get this, but we, we detect the country that it was published in and the state when possible. 
um, the primary language. This also you can obviously fill in as metadata, and we do that, but we have one person whose job it is to update our collections, <laughs> so you can imagine it's a uh, slow go for her to get through everything. Um, the collections that it's in, so that, that's the way we work is at a collection level. Um, we have here, it's in the other extremist groups study collection, I see colon, and guess what? It's also in tweeted mostly by followers of conservative politicians, <laughs> US right. So it's making its way into what is tweeted by people who follow conservative politicians. Like U.S. conservative yes. politicians. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Now is that something that you guys developed, that little No, bucket? so we do a great job of finding good things other people have done and borrowing them. Okay. <laughs> so, um, actually, that one we did. I answered you wrong on that one. But for the most part, partisan collections were borrowing methodologies. Um, I will, I'll answer you in just a minute. This particular one, our partners at Harvard did. So it was us, it just wasn't me personally. Um, and they looked at um, people, Twitter users who follow politicians and then the URLs that are shared by those users at an aggregate level. Um, we also borrowed, I think it was Lazar here um, and Robertson's, which looked at voting so people who had names and voting records for a geographic area who they could then match to a twitter user with that same name in that same geographic area and then we had then they had a panel of registered democrat registered republican and then they could look at the sources the publications that those people tweeted most and then they divided that into quintiles so you end up with sources tweeted mostly by republicans somewhat more by republicans evenly and then the same for democrats yeah so, regarding tweeted mostly by uh, followers of conservative politicians, yeah. basically they spawned a news publication and uh, followers of conservatives uh, here in the US share the same uh, URLs or share the same news articles or stories. So this is telling works? me that this source, this Polish right-wing source, was tweeted frequently enough by followers of conservative politicians that it ended up in that collection. This, okay, for me it doesn't make a lot of sense because I doubt that uh, followers of conservative uh, politicians actually speak Polish. Well, let's, let's click on it, see what happens. So yeah. this, what this will do is take us to that whole collection. Oh. Often what's happening is that somebody's tweeting that article and they have an English tweet oh. and they're saying something, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> something fascist, <laughs> and then someone else will retweet that because they see the interpretation of what's going on. And, but they still, their tweet is still showing them having linked to that. Um, people don't read the article. Yes, very rarely is it, unfortunately, that people are reading the article. Or the headline is translated into English automatically by Google and they share it. Yeah. Um, this might take a while to load because it is a large collection. So we'll leave really? it up and we'll come back to it. <laughs> Um, this is the other thing about our tool is like what you expect in terms of internet load time like go back 10 years and that's what it'll be like. No, but I'm, I'm actually surprised that the, it's a big group because you would, again it's, it's Poland. I mean, oh no no this what we're seeing here is going to be the whole list. The whole list of? Of the sources tweeted mostly by followers. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yes. Okay, so yeah, if what you wanted to see was that sort. Oh no we're not going to see the people. Okay. That's not, that's not something we're going to show. Okay. Um, all right, so should we try something in the search together? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So what Explorer is doing is going into only our news corpus, so not the social platform. That lives in topic member. And showing you domains of attention, language, and entities um, for your search. I'm actually curious about yeah. something. Uh, for a while now, I uh, wanted to know exactly uh, the biases of the media. So basically, how much is on the left, how much is on the right, exactly. Because it's talking a lot about in plus, it's talk, you know, they talked a lot about everywhere. But I never actually gone out and checked myself, like, uh, which sources are biased and which are not, well, which sources are biased to the left and which sources are biased to the right. I never actually checked it myself properly. I just assumed from what they covered. So can you actually check it here? So there is no universal truth about, or like pure truth about that <laughs> because it is, it is both relative. 
it's all a relative scale and it's to some degree subjective so that's why there's different methodologies and so in research you just have to say here's the methodology i picked here's who else did it here are the citations here's why i justify it um some people would go based more on uh, the content of the news itself, so what they're covering, or maybe what they're not covering, or how they're covering it, that's certainly a valid way. What we have ended up more on is user-based. So the people who follow certain people, or are registered to certain parties, mm -hmm. who affiliate to this publication are sharing this a lot. We, we feel like that's a justifiable methodology. So you're not using natural NLP or anything like that for the article? No, we're not. Okay. Yeah, so you, one could, and if you wanted to, if you, that was what you wanted, you could ask us, hey, this is the collection I would like. I want this label, right, because it's how I've studied it, and then you could study it in our tooling that way. Okay, here's a, another one. Mm -hmm. uh, can we actually check how much uh, left-leaning uh, people repeat the right thing sources, and how much right-leaning people repeat left right? Uh, yeah, so what you bring up is a great point. Um, sharing what we call hate sharing <laughs> being like look at this horrible thing and that's certainly in there we we aren't the ones that made these um collections or methods but we know that those that did did do enough random sampling and checking at the content of the what was written and who the follower followed to decide that it wasn't significant enough to change and in some cases i know there's certain publications that the um researchers did a sanity check and they said wow we know this is a really right-leaning source like why is it ending up in the center and it was because so many left-leaning people were being like look at this garbage so it ended up getting pulled into the center so they make adjustments as as needed yeah um i remember a good example i was in jody's class oh uh -huh. so um i don't know maybe we can use a child welfare system like as sure. an example it was an open source yeah, the child welfare search, you mean? Yes, mm -hmm. like how media covers that. Yeah, sure, let's do that. I don't know why this zero is showing up and it's worrying me. <laughs> Let everyone cross your fingers. So when you go on our page, this is explore.mediacloud.org. Um, it looks like you could put something in there. You can, don't do that. I think this invites you to think it's like Google, where yeah, if I wrote it. golden retrievers, like it would do that but it's not. It's a very strict Boolean search. So you have to do or or and and parentheses and quotes. And if I wrote golden retrievers, what it would actually search is golden or retrievers. So it wouldn't be what I wanted. So ignore that and start here. <laughs> Just hit go. So you have your box for your search terms. So this is really the like bread and butter of the research. If this is cr trash, everything else is going to be trash. You have to be really careful with how you're phrasing what you're looking for. And the best way to sort of check, hey, is this what I want, is once you've created your terms and got some results, go down to your 10 random articles here. This is what that is. And if more than two of these are not about what you are looking for, there's a problem with your query. And you should go back and make some edits. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna show you this because it's helpful. Oh, we're running out of time, I'll be quick. Um, just a reminder, if you're not as familiar with Boolean searching, uh, the ways to do that, the or, the and, the nots. You can use an asterisk to do stemming. So I'm just, I'm working on a, a project now about immigration coverage, so I've done I-M-M-I-G-R-A stem. So that hits me, immigrants, immigration, immigrant. Um, you can search in other languages. You can search in quotations and parentheses and proximity. This is one I do want to mention because it can be really powerful. If I just put um, something that could show up, like, a, a politician's name yes that's a meaningful thing to see how often they show up but what if i really want like our kamala harris paper is coverage about the person i might need to make it more targeted so it's not just a mention it's not just there was a vote and she voted this way so the way that you would do that is to do something like this so five mentions to her name in a thousand words so what a quotation in Boolean search actually means is that the space between the words is zero. It's assuming this when you don't have anything. So what you're saying is, okay, I actually want it in a thousand words. So that allows you to get more relevancy is the word I would use. All right, so let's do the um, child. Do you remember what we did? Was it just child welfare? Yeah, in Massachusetts. Yeah. 
to have both of them. Yeah, and I think we did or DCF or Department of Children and Families. So that's what I would maybe start with, and then this is so iterative. You want to see, am I missing an important keyword? Is some source of noise coming up that I can not, I can add a not and eliminate? And select your media. We default to our US national collection, but I'm going to change it to Massachusetts. So I'm going to go here and go to geographic, and this is where I can do. I didn't show you this too much in Source Manager, but we have country collections for, I believe, all the countries in the world. And then for many countries, we have the subdivisions as well. Certainly for the US, we have a collection for each state. Can I ask you a trick political question? A what question? A trick political question. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sure. Usually you don't say it's a trick question when you're asking it, but go ahead. I know, but still, I just want to give a word yeah. warning. So do you actually have Taiwan here as a country or not? I think we do. We try. That's a great question, actually. And like we realized that Guam wasn't in the U.S. collection. So there are there's meaning to the way we define geography, certainly. Um, and you can go check that out. If you go to Source Manager and then the drop down is Geographic, you'll see how everything's listed. All right, so I'm going to change the dates because, as I mentioned, everything is broken right now. And we will do it for the beginning of last year until the day that the system busted out, which is November 15th. I mean, September 15th. Hopefully this works out well for us. And as it is loading, I'm going to talk to you through these two. So these are our three analysis tabs. Um, I preloaded this, my apologies, but hopefully it won't take too long. Um, attention is going to show you a chart of the volume of stories over time. It's defaulting to our normalized view, so the percent. So again, what the universe here is, is our Massachusetts sources, which if I clicked on this, it would take you to a page where you'd see them. I think it's about 200. Um, and so for those sources, what percent of the stories that were published each day were mentioning these terms? going to be pretty low because this is a really specific one. Oh dear. Oh, it worked. Yay. So what do you notice about this? Right away, something happened that caused a really big spike in coverage. So right away, we can see there was some news event here. And that otherwise, average coverage is what, half a percent or so? I'm not that surprised by that. Um, Big topics like the economy are going to live around 10% every day. Um, Donald Trump was getting like 20 a day on the heyday of his <laughs> time. Um, and then really more niche topics are usually around half to 1%. Uh, but let's figure out what this is. So I can, two things I can do. I can click and drag to zoom in and then I can click on the date. So it was the 17th of April, I'm gonna click that, and then what it's gonna give me is some sample sentences and a word cloud for the day. So I can quickly see what it was. Well, I remember this from the class. It was, um, was it the trial? Do you remember? Yeah, it was a case. Yeah, there was a child welfare case, and I think it was the trial of the parents was that date. And the child was Jeremiah, yeah. Um, so that's what you can do with that. But you see, that's a huge jump, over 3%. That was a really big news event that day um, from the lower level. And then here's our 10 sample stories that you can go read just to get a quick sense of what's going on. Or here is where you, I'm not gonna do it now because it'll take a long time, but you can download your CSV of all 400 stories, you are not getting full text. That is because it would be a massive copyright violation. <laughs> what you are getting is the URL, who published it, when, um, themes that are detected in coverage, um, whether it's an AP story, we call them metadata about it. And then you can go and look at the URL yourself, or some people will write a scraper, and then they'll use that to go and get full text from scraping. How do you deal with paywalls? which are becoming increasingly prevalent. Yeah, so some of it, so most of our content ingest is through RSS feeds. So some places that have a paywall on a user going to the site, 
are not doing that with an RSS publication. And we're just ingesting that in like a Feedly or like any RSS reader. Some of it, we, the way that we identify ourselves as not a human, but like a bot tracker, it will let us in. Oh, okay. Um, and then some of it, we get the preview, like paragraph and a half, and that's all we can analyze. So, um, so you, are you blocked from some sites? Then? Yeah, okay. not many, but some. Okay. Um, and we also are now looking at sitemap scraping as a way to do ingest. We just started doing that. So even though it's not as common to see in a user-facing site, a lot of sites will still have a sitemap built in, and then we can go there and, and scrape and grab data that way. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna move quickly because I see we have like one more minute. Um, language tab is gonna give us our top words to show us like what is actually being said here. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to show you now, but there's a way to do a comparison query where you add one up here. So in Jody's class, we compared to New York's coverage of that same topic. And which one was it that had more abuse? Was it New York? I don't remember. One of the state's words like abuse it was, um, and murder were higher. It was just more of a, yeah, a frame around that. The comparison is a really powerful tool in this that we have here. Um, and then for any of these words, you can click on it and you can see a word tree of what's the context that that word was showing up in. Um, so we'll let that substance abuse actually. Interesting, not what I was thinking, along with child abuse too. Um, this is, I'm not gonna explain this in the time we have, but if you wanna learn about this, I'll tell you about it later. Um, it's a word space, like vectorization of the words and how they show up in relation to each other. And then this is that automated theme detection down here, which hopefully will load in a minute. Um, and then the last tab, I know we're over time, is just the entities, the top people and organizations mentioned. So this is where people, you know, if you're a child welfare organization or an advocacy group, you want to see yourself in this. And maybe you could download for last year and then for this year, and did you get higher in the percentages and who is up there? So I'm sorry that this isn't loading, and I'm sure we'll have places to go. I'm sorry I didn't leave time for questions. <laughs> we kind of oh, had it throughout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is great. No, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Awesome. You're welcome. Well,